Okay, so last time we introduced the idea of, of laser cooling by saying that, you know, photons of light carry some momentum, right? And if you uh, have a photon of light interact with an atom, right, that it has the photon that has the right frequency to be absorbed by that atom, when it gets absorbed, the atom moves up to a higher internal energy state and also will get a kick in the direction that the, the photon was headed. The photon momentum is transferred to the atom, which means it, it, it gets a little bit of a kick, and we can add those up to make a force that can change the velocity of atoms. And that's how we're going to use lasers to make things cold. All right. So what are we talking about for, for the force here? Well, the, the force um, has to do with the momentum carried by the atom. So um, that, that momentum by the, the photon, I mean, uh, the photon momentum is going to be Planck's constant divided by the, the wavelength. And that's going to be transferred to the atom, right? So the atom is going to acquire a velocity such that its momentum mv is equal to the h over lambda momentum of the photon. Uh, if you do uh, a little bit of math with that and talk about rubidium at 87 atoms, right? The mass is 87 atomic mass units. The wavelength of light you use to interact with rubidium atoms is about 780 nanometers, 780 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. Put those numbers together, do a little bit of math, you get a, a, a change in velocity from absorbing a single photon of about 6 millimeters per second. All right. That's really, really small, right? That's not a, a big number at all, but photons are cheap, right? It's easy to get tons and tons of photons. It's not very good laser pointer that I have in my, my presentation remote here. Uh, if you can see that red spot on the screen, that's about 10 to the 15 photons per second hitting that whiteboard, right? I can get lots and lots of photons. If I can add up many, many photons, uh, I can get a big force. Even though each individual photon makes only a tiny change in the velocity, I can make a big net change by adding together lots and lots of them. Right? It's sort of like if you had a bowling ball rolling toward you and you had a, an infinite supply of ping pong balls. Right? Any individual ping pong ball bounced off the bowling ball isn't going to make it slow down very much. But if you have lots of them and you throw them at it at repeatedly, you can, can bring it to a stop. Now, there's a complication here, which is, right, I, I excite the uh, electron inside the atom to a higher energy orbit, right, but it's not going to stay there. It's going to drop back down. It's going to re-emit a photon. And so you can ask, well, does that complicate things? The answer is it turns out to be not really. Okay. Uh, and, and the reason for this, we can see, is that the, the emission of the photon goes in a random direction. So what happens is I have an atom, right, sitting there in the, in the ground state. And a photon comes along, interacts with that atom, gets absorbed, puts the atom in an excited state, and the atom picks up a little bit of momentum. It starts moving, right? It feels a force, okay? But, you know, it starts moving, and sometime later, it's going to re-emit the photon, return to the ground state, to the lowest energy state. Uh, and when it does, it spits that photon out in a random direction. All right, well, the photon goes out in a random direction, the atom recoils in the opposite direction. It gets a little bit of a kick, right? So uh, for this example, say the, the photon uh, gave the atom a, a kick, so it starts moving right to left. Uh, the emitted photon goes up, so now it's moving you know, down and to the left. Right. Um, now if you repeat this many, many times, right, each time absorbing a photon coming from uh, right, moving from right to left, uh, those kicks from the, the initial photon are always going to be in the same direction. But the kicks from the emitted photon are going to be in random directions. So the next one might be, you know, uh, uh, off in a uh, almost forward direction, in which case, you know, it, it really slows the atom down, and now it's moving, you know, slowly up and to the right. Okay. Uh, or, you know, the photon might go almost straight backward, in which case the kicks kind of add together, and you get a, a, a much bigger um, velocity going to the left, right? These random kicks, if you repeat them often enough, are going to cancel each other out, right? Overall, right, repeated many, many times, each time the photon gets a kick to the left, uh, but the second kick from the emitted photon isn't going to add up in the same way. Uh, and we can see this photographically uh, in a, a beautiful experiment that was done at NIST uh, about 20 years ago. Um, where they, they start with a, a bunch of atoms that are almost at absolute zero, and shine on a laser so that some fraction of those atoms absorb one photon each. And what we see is those, those atoms expand out into a ring, right? You get this, this diamond ring looking shape because every atom that absorbed a photon got a kick to the left, 
and then they get a kick in a random direction um, from the uh, emitted photon that, that spreads them out in the ring. But you can see that ring is distinctly to the left of the BEC, right? All of those atoms that are moving now right to left, uh, all of them have gotten a kick from that photon. And, you know, if you repeat this many, many times, every time you get one kick to the left. So this allows you to add together lots of, of photons and get a, a significant change in the uh, momentum of your atoms. Um, how big a force are we talking about? Well, force is going to be change in momentum uh, over time, right? So if I want to know uh, what the force is, I'm going to need the momentum per photon multiplied by the number of photons per second. How often do I get photons in there? Um, this is another thing we can do sort of a, a ballpark estimate of and get a, a number for this. Um, and what we would say is, you know, that, look, these, these atoms, they have a lifetime, right? There's some amount of time you put them into the excited state. There's some amount of time that they stay there before they drop back to the ground state on average. Okay. Usually this is, you know, tens of nanoseconds for the sorts of atoms that we laser cool. Um, so I can define this, the scattering rate as, look, I can say each time the photon goes up, it stays in that excited state. It can't absorb another photon while it's there. I have to wait a time tau for it to uh, come back down. So then the rate of scattering, the maximum number of photons per second I could possibly scatter is going to be one over that lifetime tau. Right. So then I know what the momentum uh, per photon is. It's h bar times k. I know what the uh, scattering rate is, roughly. It's 1 over tau. I can put those numbers together uh, using rubidium 87. The wavelength is 780 nanometers. The lifetime of the excited state is about 27 nanoseconds. Um, I put those together, and I get a force that is, you know, it's 10 to the minus 20 newtons. That's really not very big. But the thing to remember about this is right, F equals MA, right? I have a very small force, 10 to the 20 newtons, but atoms are really tiny. The mass of an atom is really small, so the acceleration to that force can be very substantial. In fact, if I put the numbers in for the, for the mass of rubidium atom, the, the acceleration is like 20,000 Gs, right? The acceleration is huge. So I can make a really big acceleration um, using repeated photon scatter. Okay, but there's another problem here, which is um, if I start with a sample of atoms that are moving very fast and I shine a laser uh, to, to try and slow them down, I can make those fast atoms slow down. But I can also take uh, atoms that are already moving slowly, and if I shine laser light on them, I can make them speed up. Right? So these things would seem to cancel each other out. It seemed to be sort of fruitless to shine lasers on atoms because you know, you're going to slow down some of the fast ones, but you're going to speed up some of the slow ones. Uh, you know, it's a wash in the end. So what we need is we need a tr clever trick that we can use to only cool the atoms and not heat the atoms. Right. Uh, and that trick uses the Doppler effect. Right. The Doppler effect is this change in frequency of waves from a moving source. You're going to hear a fair bit about that in this, um, in this course because it comes up uh, a lot in the, the dark matter uh, galaxy uh, module later. Um, so if I have a, a source that's emitting waves at some particular frequency, uh, if that source starts moving or I start moving relative to it, I'm going to see those waves arrive at a different frequency. Right? If the source is moving toward me, it's sort of uh, each new wave that it emits catches up to the ones in front of it. Right? So the frequency of the waves arriving at me is going to be higher. On the other hand, if the source is moving away, right, each new wave it emits is kind of uh, running away from the previous ones. Those waves are going to arrive less frequently. I'm going to see a lower frequency. Uh, this is the Doppler effect. It's most familiar with, with sound waves. This is why, you know, uh, every elementary school kid knows that the noise a race car makes is meow, right? As the car is coming toward you, the sound of the engine is shifted up in frequency by the Doppler effect. As it's going away from you, it's shifted down. And as it passes, it changes very rapidly from one to the other, which is why there's that meow noise if, if uh, you're talking about a race car. Right. This also works for light waves, right? and the, the shift depends on the velocity. The higher the velocity, the bigger the shift. We can write this in terms of the uh, change in the angular frequency associated with the light, this delta omega, uh, and that uh, turns out to be equal to uh, it's, you know, 2 pi over lambda uh, times v. 
right, the velocity, or it's it's k times v. It's this wave number two pi over the, over lambda associated with the light multiplied by the velocity of the source or of the, the atom that's absorbing. All right, so how does this Doppler effect help us? Well, what we do is we take our laser and we tune it to a slightly lower frequency than the atoms want to absorb. Uh, this is referred to as red detuning because uh, red light has a lower frequency than blue light. So we detune this, this uh, laser slightly to the red, and a stationary atom sitting there looking at the light coming in is going to say, nah, the frequency is too low, I'm not absorbing that. Uh, if it doesn't absorb the light, it doesn't feel a force. On the other hand, if the atom is moving toward the laser, Right? What the atom sees is not the rest frequency of that, that laser, but it sees the Doppler shifted frequency that's shifted up. The shifted up, well, now it's closer to being resonant with the frequency that the atom wants to absorb. Well, atom's going to look at it and say, yeah, I'll absorb that. Get that, that uh, absorb that photon, pick up that momentum, and it feels a force. Right? That force is only going to act on atoms that are moving toward the laser. When the force acts on atoms moving toward the laser, it slows them down. So this is a cooling force. This is a force that will only slow atoms down. It will not speed atoms up. By slow-moving atoms, they're not going to interact with the laser at all. Um, they're going to just sit there. Uh, Fast-moving atoms that are moving toward the laser will see the frequency shifted up. They're more likely to absorb. When they absorb, they slow down. So we can use this Doppler effect to arrange to only cool atoms. And the best part is we can do this in multiple dimensions. Right? If we take two lasers, we take a pair of laser beams both tuned to the red, you know, to the red of the, the resonance, um, they're only going to interact with atoms that are moving toward the individual lasers. Right? So uh, in the, the cartoon here, the atoms that are moving right to left are going to interact with laser one that's coming in from the left. Uh, when they do, they feel a force that slows them down. On the other hand, the, the atoms that are moving to the right, they're going to interact with laser 2 coming in from the right. Um, and when they do, they're going to feel a force that slows them down. Neither group of atoms will interact with the other laser and speed up. So we get cooling no matter which direction the atoms try to move. Whichever way they try to go, they feel a force that slows them down. All right. This is sort of uh, analogous to the, the situation of a particle caught in a viscous fluid, right? If you, have, you know, if, if you were in a swimming pool full of some, you know, thick, sticky liquid like molasses, right? Any direction you try to move, you feel a force that's resisting your motion, right? So this is this picks up the name optical molasses. Um, the actual situation is a little more complicated, but you know, here are some uh, equations for what the forces are. Uh, you can see, you know, the, the uh, frequency de dependence isn't perfectly, you know, exactly one frequency. There's some range of, of detunings over which these things will still interact with the light and feel a force. Um, you could do a, a ton of algebra with this. When you do that, it comes out and gets you a force that depends on, you know, a bunch of stuff multiplied by the velocity of the atoms. This is mathematically really identical to moving around in a viscous fluid. The faster you try to go, the bigger the force that, that uh, pushes back on you. So again, the, the name optical molasses comes from this relationship between, you know, any direction you try to move, you feel a force that pushes back on you, and that force increases with your velocity. Uh, so this is an extremely effective way of slowing things down in the same way that, you know, throwing a person into a swimming pool full of molasses and is, is an extremely effective way of keeping them from moving around. So um, we can do this in three dimensions. We can take uh, pairs of beams along sort of the three Cartesian axes. So if I, I can have a pair of beams, you know, one coming in from the left, one coming in from the right, one coming in from the top, one from the bottom, and, you know, in and out of the, the screen, I take three pairs of beams. Um, along each of those dimensions, no matter which direction the atoms try to move, they feel a force that slows them down. They, you can cool them in three dimensions and make a very cold gas of atoms. So this picture here is a, a gas of sodium atoms, uh, which absorb and emit light in this, this orangey yellow color, about 589 nanometers. Um, and you can see, right, you can see uh, some fluorescence from the beams as they pass through the sodium paper. And right in the center where all of these beams come together is a bright spot. That's millions of sodium atoms that have been cooled to temperatures uh, in the 100 microkelvin kind of range. 
So uh, this shows that we can get atoms cold in three dimensions, collect a bunch of them in this, this optical molasses. Um, how cold can we get with this? Well, there's a limit to this, this Doppler cooling uh, phenomenon, which comes from the fact that, that you still have this random scattering. Right? Every time the atom absorbs a photon and slows down, it's going to re-emit that photon and get a kick in a random direction. Okay, that, so you're slowing the motion in one direction, but you're increasing motion in some other direction after the kick from the, the emitted photon. Uh, you can kind of balance these two out against each other, and what you find is that there is a minimum temperature that depends on the scattering rate. Um, and uh, for typical atoms, this comes out around 100 microkelvin. So that's kind of the, the limit of what you can do with laser cooling is to get atoms down to temperatures of about 100 one millionths of a degree above absolute zero. Now that's about a factor of a thousand hotter than what we want to do this tunneling experiment, but this is an excellent first step, right? So, uh, so, so we're, we're doing good here. And uh, in a future class, we'll talk about the techniques for getting that, that extra factor of a thousand down to uh, be able to, to get to a place where we can really see this tunneling. Um, I should also note that, that just laser cooling uh, will get you uh, more of, uh, of that distance. There's a phenomenon called Sisyphus cooling, which is fascinating, really interesting, you know, great physics in a, in a lot of respects. It's also a little too complicated to try and jam in here at the end of this, this video. So, um, but the, uh, Sisyphus cooling will let you just, with forces exerted by light, will let you get down to a few one millionths of a degree above absolute zero. Um, once you do that, right, once you have that technique, you also want to be able to accumulate a large number of these atoms to be able to work with them and, and, and measure the uh, effects that we're, we're looking for. Um, and that requires some additional techniques, uh, which will be the subject of the next video in this, this ongoing series of, of little video lectures. So stay tuned for that.